verse 10. Uh, let us stand as we read our text this morning. My message this morning is about the victorious life. The victorious life. And in the Bible, the words of Jesus, Jesus said, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. So let us pray this morning. Father, we ask that your perfect will would be done this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would anoint this message, Lord, that I can bring it forth, and that it will be a blessing and a help and encouragement to each one this morning. So just be with me as I bring forth your word. Have your way in the remainder of the service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated if you wish. So this morning, as we look at this scripture, I was thinking about the word abundantly. Uh, you know what I'm convinced of? I'm convinced that Christians are victorious people. We live a victorious life. We are not defeated. Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so, as we look at this, that the Word of God and our relationship with God, I think uh, many times I see so many Christians that I believe as living way beneath their privilege. Uh, I think there's more for Christians than what uh, a lot of Christians realize. Uh, I was thinking about the the children of Israel when they left the bondage of Egypt and they went out in the desert and it was like less than a three week journey over to the promised land. They could have walked, they could have went on in that promised land uh, if they would have just trusted in the Lord and they would have, uh, the, the God said it would be a land that flowed with milk and honey. Uh, everything they had need of would all be in that promised land and so forth and yet uh, what happened was they didn't trust God didn't believe in him and so they why they wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years and most of them people that left Egypt never made it to the promised land but spend their life wandering around there in the wilderness well I want you to realize something this morning those people were still God's people even though they was wandering around in the wilderness, they was just living way beneath what they could have had, what they could have been blessed with. And so I was trying to think of a way to express what the word abundant life is. What is an abundant life? And, and so I began to look at that and, and uh, look at the, uh, at the word of God and prayed about this message this morning. And, and I just got to thinking about this. Uh, you know, I, I know that there's a lot of preachers today uh, that is preaching that if you come to the Lord, all your troubles is going to end, everything's going to be great, and everything's going to be wonderful, and so forth. But when people get saved, they find out that it doesn't work that way. We still have problems in this life. We have situations that we face, even though we're the children of God. But... I think we can go too far with that also. So we need to reach a happy medium there someplace, get a balance, uh, because we are victorious people. We have a great life in Christ, and it's just a wonderful thing to belong to the Lord. So I was thinking about when we, uh, uh, when we come to the Lord and we accept the Lord in our lives, He enters into our life and he dwells with us and he makes us a victorious people, a people that has an abundant life. Now to me, an abundant life, what that means and what is available and what most Christians have, although there are some that don't, some still out in the wilderness wandering around, but what we have uh, from the Lord in our lives is we have a life that is full of just good things. We are we have hope, we have a future, uh, we have uh, so much to live for. Life is just full of joy and, and a lot of things. And so this morning what I what I'm going to do, I'm going to look at the fifth chapter of the book of Galatians, verses 22 and 23, 
And I want to go through these, uh, these things uh, in this verse, and I want to just look at those and take a look at what uh, is available for all of us as the children of God. And in, in Galatians chapter 5, and verse 22 and 23, the Bible says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And so, as we look at the Word of God, we find that when the Spirit of the Lord comes into our life, then the fruits of that Spirit that dwells in us is all of these great things that it says here in the book of Galatians. So I want to take a look at these uh, different things one at a time and let's see what, the, what these are about and see what's really available and what most of us experience as children of the Lord. Uh, the word love. What is love? And we can find different definitions, and actually if you looked up the, the word, and you'll find that this word was translated from, uh, I forget if it's four or five different Greek words that was translated into love and had different meanings. But the one that, is, that was used here in the book of Galatians is agape love. And you know what agape love is? The word agape is a, is a Greek word, and it means to give expecting nothing in return. To give expecting nothing in return. Now that's love. If you have that agape love, then you're just outgoing and giving to those around you. Uh, I looked up the definition actually of all these words, and love is an attribute of God. The Bible says that God is love. That is his basic personality, uh, if we can use that word personality. He's not a person, but still we use that word, and his basic uh, disposition or character is he is a God of love. And so that's one definition, uh, but there's another definition, and that is love is a Christian virtue. A Christian virtue, uh, affection, uh, and, uh, and and uh, it's virtue and affection, and you'll find that love, according to the teachings of Jesus, love kind of sums up the entire Mosaic law. Uh, he Jesus said this that the. He said, all the commandments hinge on these two things, that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. So love is uh, the fulfillment of the Old Testament teachings, all of, the, all of those teachings. And of course, if we have perfect love in our life, it will fulfill all the teachings of the New Testament also. So that's just a wonderful thing. So that's the first uh, thing here uh, that's listed in Galatians 5 and verse 22 and 23. So uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love. It is also joy. Now what does joy mean besides this young lady that plays our piano? Uh, we, uh, <coughs> we're glad for that joy, aren't we? And so uh, I think she does such a great job and I, I don't say enough about the talents we have in our church, but I do recognize them and appreciate them. And so we find that joy is a, is a characteristic of a Christian, and the word joy means cheerfulness or delight. Cheerfulness or delight. Now isn't that a wonderful uh, explanation and a wonderful thing to, to have to be cheerful and and to delight in things and uh, and so forth. So this is we're talking about the fruit of the spirit. Uh, I could have brought forth this morning the works of the flesh, but I I don't want to be negative at all this morning. I want to uh, preach a a positive message uh, because I just want to relate what Christians are really about, and this is the fruits that comes 
from having Christ in your life. So it's love, joy, and peace. Uh, someone said one time that uh, I thought was very good. It says that, uh, uh, and, and by the way, give me, I'll give you the definition first. Peace means quietness or rest. Quietness or rest. So I thought that was pretty good definitions. Uh, the, it is said that, that faith brings hope. And we're going to get to faith here in a little bit, so I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, because the two kind of go together. But faith brings hope, and hope brings uh, uh, hope brings peace, and peace brings rest. And so when we look at that uh, kind of a formula or uh, a way of saying things and explaining things, we find that uh, peace is a wonderful thing to have. It's wonderful to be at peace. I find that today and the day that we live, there's a lot of turmoil uh, in the lives of people. People are upset about this and upset about that and worried about tomorrow, worried about uh, whatever, what's, you know, what's the future hold and all these things. You know what? If we have Christ in our life, then we don't have to worry about, uh, uh, about the future or those things because as we sang the song this morning, I, just, I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. And with that, now we know that our future is secure, and we can just be at peace and not worry about what's taking place around about us, but just enjoy the presence of the Lord and our relationship with Him. And so peace is a, a wonderful thing to have. We can lay down at night and, and shut your eyes and go to sleep without worrying about things and being upset uh, about what's taking place. So love, joy, and peace, and the next item in the fruits of the Spirit is a very great one, wonderful one, it's long-suffering. Long-suffering, so what does, what does long-suffering mean exactly? What is that really all about? And because it's something that's in the lives of Christians that we will if we allow it to come out and be part of us, then it's there to make us better people. Long-suffering means to be enduring, to be patient. Uh, the Bible says that God was long-suffering in the days of Noah, in Noah, and it also says that he is long-suffering today. So God is a patient God that is, uh, you know, he will put up with us and put up with us and our shortcomings and, and the things in our lives. I, uh, I find that a lot of people has the wrong idea about God and our relationship with God. I think there's a lot of people that is afraid that God is going to get on their case about something all the time and, and worried about whether they're pleasing God. And, and this is what I don't like about churches that is into legalism because they have all these rules that you have to live by and I find the people that attend those churches many of them are just uh, uh, trying to be aware all of time to make sure that they don't violate one of those rules or just really worry about that and and so forth you know what we don't have to worry about that and we don't have to worry about those things uh, like that because God is long-suffering if we should stumble and fall God doesn't just uh, uh, rake us over the coal and bring some great punishment on us and, and that sort of thing but he's very patient with us and he'll begin to speak to us and and ask us to repent which means to not to do that again and if we don't and we just look to him and ask him to forgive us we can just go on and live a, a good, peaceful, happy life. And so, did you know God really wants us to be happy? He wants His people to be happy people. And we, we can be happy, we can be content, we can feel secure, uh, because He is our Savior and He's our Lord. And He <coughs> is our provider. He just takes care of every element that there is in our lives. And so this morning, God is a long-suffering God. The next item here is gentleness. 
gentleness. I, I, I think about this when I was doing this, and I was thinking about a book I have, um, and that it's, uh, it's about a relationship with uh, a man and his wife, and the title of that book is, is called, uh, Is There a Man in the House? Is There a Man in the House? And it starts right out talking to men about how they should treat women, i.e. eventually their wives and, <coughs> and so forth. And, and the first chapter is, is called, it's called Steel and Velvet. And it says that women likes their husband to be strong as steel, but soft as velvet. And meaning gentle and, and kind and, and so forth, but yet uh, to be men, to stand up and take authority and, and take responsibility and, and all of those wonderful things. It's a great book. Uh, I've had it for many, many years and I sometimes uh, think about a lot of the things that's, that's written in that book because uh, we need to be that kind of a individual as men. Uh, we want women to be uh, strong, don't we, and uh, hard workers, but we want them also to be soft and feminine and, and, uh, and, and some of those attributes that's wonderful uh, for the opposite sex. And so we find here that God is long-suffering. He's very gentle. God, the word gentleness, which is the next one here, means to be gracious, kind, and easy. I like that. I really like that. I, I think we need to be easy. We need to uh, just take life easy and and be responsible and and uh, and take the responsibilities of life. But we need to be uh, people that uh, uh, that that kicks back and, and enjoys life. I I remember. How many remember when Brother Penrod, David Penrod, was with us? Remember when he spoke for us? Uh, you know what he. We went out to a conference. He spoke to for us on a Sunday, and and then I spent a couple of days with him. Went up to Tahoe and Virginia City, and showed him his, uh, a nice time while he was with us. And, and when he got up to preach at the conference, he told the people. He said, "I was with Brother and Sister Wilsey." He said, and and, uh, and and for the last couple of days, and he said, "What really impressed me most about." Brother Wilsey and Sister Wilsey was that they are the most laid-back people I've ever seen, I think. Uh, well, I have never been described like that before, I don't think. Uh, but he seemed to notice that and was impressed. But I, I really don't worry about too much. I try to keep track of things and, and uh, be responsible and do the things that needs to be done. But... Uh, I don't really worry so much about anything. I know that God's in control and He's going to take care of everything. So uh, we need to uh, we need to be men needs to be gentlemen and women needs to be ladies and that's what uh, the kind of individuals that God wants us to be. And then the word goodness is the next one here. Goodness is a is a, a, a kind of a broad term, I think, because good does, we can be good in a lot of different ways, can't we? We can just be good in a lot of different ways, but the definition of goodness means to have virtue or, or benevolence, virtue and benevolence, goodness, and that's the definition according to Strong's is where these definitions came from, and so it's uh, it's interesting that uh, that goodness is one of the fruits of the Spirit because we just need to be good people, just good people all the time, and people that's trustworthy, people that's honest, uh, and all of those things is something we need to endeavor and determine that we're going to be. Uh, the, 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 the next word that's in Galatians 5 and 22 and 23, which is the last word, which is a great word and, and covers a broad spectrum of our experience with God, and it's the word faith. <coughs> we need, as Christians, we don't only need to have faith, but we have to have faith. 
the Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God. So we have faith, uh, and it's uh, uh, and I like these definitions. They're very good. Uh, it means faith means to have confidence. To have confidence, uh, you could have uh, uh, when you went to sit down in a chair. Uh, do you have faith in that chair? Do you believe that chair is going to hold you when you sit down on it? Well, if you do, then you've got faith in that chair. I mean, it, and it's really that simple. It's confidence. And, and so as we look to this, we have confidence. How many of us really has confidence in God? Do you believe God's going to do what he said he would do? Did you know the Bible says it's impossible for God to lie? It's, so he's going to do exactly what he says he's going to do. And, and uh, we need to always remember that. Uh, so uh, to have faith means to be uh, to have confidence it means truthfulness of God so God's a truthful God he's honest and he's reliable uh, uh, next definition I have here is reliance upon Christ for salvation reliance on Christ for salvation uh, the Bible says he that cometh to God must believe that he is and he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So when we come to the Lord, we commit our lives to the Lord, and we must have faith in God that he will take care of us and he will do what he said he would do and what he accomplished at the cross. We must believe that that applies to our life. And when we put these in practice, we find out that it works out just the way the Bible says that it will work out. And so... Truthfulness in God, reliance on Christ. Uh, another word for faith is assurance. Uh, another one is reliance. Fidelity. All these words is words that is listed that gives a definition for faith. And so uh, it's a great thing to have the fruits of the Spirit. And we have the fruits of the Spirit uh, when we have Christ. They are in our lives, and I want to say this about the fruits of the Spirit. We have them when we accept Christ. We have, I believe we have those at that time. But we cannot afford to let them lay dormant. We must uh, cultivate them, and we must put them in practice. And when we do, they're going to produce some wonderful things in our lives. You'll find that uh, uh, Christians that uh, has these fruits of the Spirit, you'll find that we have... Uh, plenty of friends and people that like us and likes to be around us and so forth. So uh, this is a, a, a wonderful thing. I have a couple of verses of scripture for faith. And this is in the 11th chapter of Hebrews. And the 11th chapter of Hebrews is known as the faith chapter. And it gives the, it tells us about several Old Testament people and how they had faith and how it worked out great for them for the Lord and so forth and how they obtained uh, good things and it says here in, in the Hebrews chapter 11 verse 2 it says for it or by faith that the elders obtained a good report a good report and you know I, 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 I Timothy says that uh, somebody going into the ministry must have a good report from within and without so they must have a good report within the church and they must have a good report out there on the workplace or wherever there happen to be and, and still in the 11th chapter of Hebrews verse 39 talking about all those people that's listed in this in this chapter it says and these all having obtained a good report through faith uh, they received not the promise so this is all Old Testament, and they didn't receive the promise, the full promises of God until the Lord Jesus Christ came. But we have Jesus, and we have more uh, to, that we can expect and we can receive from God in this period of time that we live than what those people in the Old Testament have. And we, we have those, and by having those, uh, we have... Uh, all those fruits of the Spirit is available in our life to make us a victorious person, to make us, give us an, an abundant life in Christ. 
So this is a wonderful thing. I want to read a verse in, in uh, uh, the book of Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Uh, and it gives us some goals and some things to think about and things to cultivate in our life. And here's what it says. It says, Finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. You know, it's important of what we allow to take place in our minds. We can, we can think about all kinds of things uh, in this life and, and we can think about evil things that's going on. We can think about all kinds of things, but if we think about these things that's lifted here, listed in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, then it will make us to be a great people and, and we can walk close to God and please God in our life. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 through 10 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap. I'm getting things ready to, to plant some grass in our backyard. And I'm going to buy some grass seeds. And when we plant those, I'm going to prepare the ground and plant those seeds. And you know what I expect is going to come up? Vegetables. No. We're going to have grass come up, right? So whatever we sow, that's what's going to come. And spiritually, that is true also. So the kind of individuals that we are, uh, that we are seeking to have for our life, uh, those are the things as we plant those things in our lives, in our minds, and think on those things, then we're going to have those things that are going to take place in our lives. Okay, so what a man soweth, that shall he reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Uh, and, and you know what? That life, we don't have to wait until we die or wait until Jesus comes to receive that abundant life and that great life. But that begins right in this life, in this world. And so that's what we... Uh, need to do and it goes on to say and let us not be weary in well-doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not so when I plant that grass I'm not going to expect to have a green grass out there the next day it's going to take a little while for that grass to germinate and, and to grow and and, uh, and get uh, larger but it won't be too awfully long until I'll have a nice lawn out in my backyard and so this is what uh, uh, we need to do. And we'll need to have to water that grass and, and uh, maybe put a little uh, fertilizer on it once in a while and so forth. And so we will reap if we faint not. As we have there, and listen to this verse, verse 10. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith, especially those of the household of faith. So, as a, uh, we, we've looked at this, this whole thing and the fruits of the Spirit, and I'm sure Christians all like to have all these fruits of the Spirit in their life and, and be giants for the Lord and be wonderful Christians. Uh, uh, and so, after going through all of this and these scriptures, I have one final verse of scripture here this morning that I want to share with you and it's in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20 and it says now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us this will all happen according to the power that worketh within us so to have all these wonderful attributes, to have be a great person, and these things, we must start out by having Christ in our life. That's the first thing we must do is accept the Lord, uh, accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And so we accept Him in our life. 
and he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. How can we have that power in us? First of all, we have Jesus in our life. We accept him as our Lord and Savior. And then we, I guess the word, the best word I can think to use here is we cultivate that experience that we have with the Lord. We cultivate that by spending some time in prayer and reading the Bible, reading his word, and fellowshipping with other Christians. And so that's a, that's a formula that works in living for the Lord and having this abundant life, having a victorious life. And that is promised to us and it certainly will come about if we follow the teachings of the Word of God. And so this morning, I would just like to say that uh, uh, if, if you would like to have more of the Lord, then cultivate more of these things in your life and if you are uh, uh, if, if you haven't ever accepted the Lord then you can do that this morning also and just really commit your life to the Lord and so with that this morning let us all stand and uh, we of course are going to have a meal together and, and eat together this morning and then we're have some good fellowship together so